I I think I'm live. Yes, I am live. Hello. Hello, everyone. How you doing? I don't see anybody. I don't see anybody ever. Oh, I see six. I see the number six, which means everything in the world to me. <laughs> it means I'm not alone. I have ooh, 20 people, 26 people. Ooh, 20 more people jumped on like that. It's magical. This is genuinely magical. Right? Now, 75. Ha! Woo! We're here. It's so exciting. I can't stand it. Every week, it's so exciting. I can't stand it. Life is getting much more, um, it gets more and more exciting each week to have additional peoples with me. Not that I don't love the people I have in my life. They are amazing. But, wow, it's nice to get out among the peoples. And I really feel, every time we finish the gathering room, I feel like I've been in a room with a, you know, like a bunch of peoples. It's amazing. Hi, how are you? Okay, now I have to do my, um, the podcasty thingy. Okay. It's, um, I say, ah, welcome to the gathering room. I'm Martha Beck. Did I do it right? I think that was right. Okay. So today, what I wanted to talk to you about was um, the process of creativity, which I'm obsessed with in many ways. But I was especially interested this week in the process of creation as it applies to what we essentially are. So I've called this episode, what are you becoming? But to be more accurate with the sort of theme of it, I thought it would sound weird, but the theme is actually what is being made of me? So it's actually not as active as what, I'm, as what am I becoming? And that gave me a, a kind of a break because when I think what am I becoming, it's something I have to actually strive to do. But, um, this week, well, let me set it up. So raised in Western culture, like, you know, has it roots in the European enlightenment, individualism, materialistic worldview, all of that. I was raised sort of in that. And then you add Mormonism and everything gets very weird, but basically I was raised in the Western culture and that is all about becoming and striving and working and making it happen. And whether you're looking at the scientific or at the religious underpinnings, it's all about like having to go out and do something, right? So then I, at 17, I started studying Chinese, very different cultural underpinnings. Like there were people in ancient China who lived 10 miles apart from each other and spoke a completely different dialect. They all read with the same characters, but the pronunciation would sort of drift over time so that different little tiny settlements would have their own separate languages. And some, I mean, that's the, that is the really like crushing thing about studying any Chinese dialect. I studied Mandarin, which is also called literally everybody talk. But when I went to China, there are like hundreds and hundreds of different dialects because nobody ever left their villages. It wasn't a very mobile society. So they had a philosophy that's about stillness and about what can be found in stillness. And I've been there, I've been mesmerized by that. And also Japanese culture, which is very different, but also has the Buddhist tradition in Zen, particularly I found this stillness that I really ached for after growing up in Western culture and trying and trying and trying and trying so hard. And then I encountered these philosophies that just said, why don't you sit down for a while? I love that. So I've been sitting down for a while, like years. <laughs> I've been sitting and sitting and it helped that I got really sick and I couldn't move much for, oh, I don't know, 12, 20 years, something like that. Uh, and I, I, I went inward in stillness and found this really rich um, uh, source that's available to all of us all the time that is inexhaustible and comforting and beautiful and it's wondrous. But this week I started reading a book called The Radiance Sutras by Lauren Roche. And I think someone sent it to me. It seems to be signed. I don't know, it's hard to read the signature, 
But if it came, if I didn't find a card with it. So if you send it to me, or if Lauren Roche yourself sent it to me, I am really enjoying it. And it's taken from the uh, uh, Vijnana Bhaitava Tantra texts, I think. I don't speak any Sanskrit, you guys. So please send in your corrections of my pronunciation and or completely getting the wrong words. Anyway, it's about uh, a conversation between the divine masculine and the divi divine feminine elements of creation. And I have to say, though I did not study the Indian subcontinent as part of my degree in East Asian languages and civilizations, because it was East Asian, um, I do believe that that particular part of the world developed the most sophisticated vocabularies and conceptual um, and concepts for describing spiritual phenomena because it's there in India, it's there in Tibet, it's like really rich in that area. And so they have all these different ways of expressing stuff that is very awkward to express in Western languages or even in Chinese and Japanese. I think I don't speak Sanskrit. Anyway, here's my point. In these sutras, which a sutra is just um, a very brief little bit of text that is meant to like give you a uh, what in Japan is called a satori, a little burst or big burst of awakening, where you drop concepts that were keeping you from your, your own inner light and you become clearer and you see truth. You, you come out of illusion and you see more truth. So what it says is that the, the male principle in the universe is the stillness that holds everything and it's consciousness. So it's completely still. It's it's no thingness, it's not even space. It's less of a thing than space, but it's everywhere. It pervades everything. It never moves, nothing can disturb it. And it just holds everything in love. And if you sit long enough and you go inward long enough, you will encounter this. And it's, it's you don't mistake it. It's not like, I think, I think, it's like falling in love, right? Where you're going, I think, I don't know, I really like that person, but, and then you really fall in love and it's like, oh no, this is the, this is the thing. And you can sit for a long time and go, yeah, I feel peaceful. I feel pretty good. And then one day you hit it and it's like, oh, it's whoo, whoa, nothing is like I thought it was and everything loves me and it's okay. And yes, there is sickness and there's death and there's loss, but it's all suspended in this absolute love that is holding everything. Okay. So that's the stillness part of it. But in these sutras, they have the feminine principle that comes in as creativity. So you've got total stillness, but within that, a continuous cycle of creation. And it struck me as I was reading these and they're beautiful. And it's uh, Lauren Roche says they're always in dialogue. So the sutras are these two principles in dialogue and they're lovers. And he said, they're always meeting, always, always, always meeting. And their favorite meeting place is the human heart, which I thought was beautifully put. So, and in every human heart, we all have the divine masculine. We all have the divine feminine principles. We all have access to those things in the universe. So there's the stillness, but since I've been reading this, as I sit to meditate, I can access that stillness most days pretty easily. And then what I've been watching is how creativity in the material world never, ever, 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 ever stops. So, um, in the Tibetan tradition, they talk about impermanence and death as being these two vital concepts that will keep you happy all the time, <laughs> where in our culture, we resist it. But in that culture, it's like everything's always changing. Everything's always being renewed. And every death is just a transformation into some other elemental form of being. But, but basic consciousness can't be destroyed. It's, it's information, so it can't be destroyed. And I've been watching how, as we all, it, it's almost like the pandemic has brought us to a point of greater quiet. In fact, I read an article this week that seismologists have found that the earth is quieter than it's ever been before since they started measuring a hundred years ago. So for a century, nobody's found an earth as quiet as the one we have now. So that like, we're, we're more towards stillness. And then um, people have asked me uh, repeatedly, why is the Black Lives Matter thing happening now? More, I mean, it's like it's been happening forever, right? Like the injustice has been going on forever. The outcry of the oppressed has been going on forever. 
but I think the quieting helped us bring that creative impulse more into the forefront. And in some ways, see, being created always feels like being destroyed. It feels like it's the great unbuilding is the line from the fabulous Rowan, who is still taking a break in Badger Haven. Um, but she wrote this beautiful poem that says, at, you know, right when humanity was going to destroy the world, then came the time of the great unbuilding when everyone's name was stillness. And in the stillness, this unbuilding is happening. So we're, we're deconstructing our culture, we're deconstructing our society, the way we live with each other, and it's happening at a deep level. It's happening for me internally, um, and then it's happening in my outward habits, and then I'm watching it spread. So I've started asking myself every morning I sit down and I get still, and then I watch what's being unbuilt in me during this time, what's being taken away. And that's pretty easy to, to look at. And you can all look at it pretty easily. And the way you know is what are you afraid to lose? And what are you grieving? And what are you trying to get back to? Like, right? It's like um, you don't, you're not afraid to lose something unless you feel that it's in some way threatened. So something may be threatened. You may be, uh, you know, maybe you were furloughed and you're like, I hope I get my job back. And we don't know yet if, if all the jobs are even coming back. So if you're afraid of losing something, it means it's threatened. And that's the first signal as to what's being unbuilt. And then the second one is, what am I already grieving? Um, I talked to you guys a week ago about having to cancel a family visit and how we had, I had to go through the grieving process for that. Um, that means you've already lost, you're in the process of losing it. Until you finish grieving, you haven't actually finished the process of being unbuilt for that particular thing. And then the, the third thing is, what are you trying to hang on to? What are you trying to get back to? So, you know, a lot of people think, oh, when all of this is over, when we have a vaccine for the virus and everything, then we're going to go back to living life the way it was before. But I've been saying from the moment the pandemic hit that anyone who's had a basic sociology class should see that it's probably never going back. I had a discussion, a fun conversation with one of my editors at Viking the other day. And she was at home and she's doing a splendid job from home. They're all doing splendid jobs from home. So I'm wondering, I don't know, and I have no inside knowledge of this, but it, if I were running the company, I would think, hmm, do I really want to pay for all that rental space? Meanwhile, the subways are running out of money and running out of customers, the trains, the commuter trains, those companies may go out of business. So the buildings may be unoccupied, the streets may be less crowded, certainly the forms of transportation we have right now may never come back. We, we don't know. So what do you want to get back to? That's probably something you're afraid of losing, which is another sign of having to unbuild that. And if you cling to it, maybe it will come back, but maybe it won't. And the longer you cling, the more attached you are, the more you'll suffer when it dissolves in your hands. So that's the sad part, but it's also interesting to say, what I'm becoming is, is being allowed for by the dissolution of what I've lost. And if you can finish grieving your losses and let go and say, okay, what comes next? There's always something coming next. There's always something coming next. And to know what's coming next here is I would refer you to a story you probably know. The story of the ugly duckling. You remember him. He was born in a nest of ducks and he never fit in and he was miserable and persecuted and sent out of the nest and even his own mother didn't love him. And then he went off by himself alone for a long time. So all that loss, right? Loss, loss, loss. He wanted so badly to be a duck. He didn't want to lose his duck home. He didn't want to, he didn't want to give up on being accepted as a duck. And then alone and grieving, he was, he's, he's by a lake one day and he looks into the sky and he sees this flock of swans and he thinks those creatures are so gorgeous and so glorious and I've failed even to be a successful duck so I could never be one of them but his heart recognizes something in the swans and he longs to be one of them and then they look down and see him and they all fly down and settle around him and he's too ashamed to look into their eyes. And so instead he looks down and when he sees his own reflection, he sees that he's also a swan. 
I think that feel, and I've seen this, you guys, I've coached literally thousands of people over the last 25 years. I will tell you something. Everybody longs to be the, what they already are. We come into the world as these radiant beings and then we're hidden in duck forms. <laughs> and when we look around us and see other radiant beings or examples of that, something pings in us like it did for the ugly duckling. And it's telling us that's our original self awakening. And that's the first sign of what we are becoming. And here's the best part. We don't have to do it. We are being made into this thing through the dissolution that we're all experiencing, whether it's from the COVID thing or from aging or from a breakup or whatever it is you lost, the way is being cleared for you to become more of the radiant being you were meant to be. And I believe that even when you get to the final dissolution of death of the physical body, that too, if you get, if you happen to have a death where you can feel yourself going, read um, In Love with the World by Younger Minge Rinpoche. Brilliant account of somebody actually having a near-death experience and watching himself die and letting go, letting go of everything. And when he finally lets go of it all, he becomes one with the radiance that is his original nature. In, the, in Tibetan traditions, the moment when the soul regains its seamless connection with the universe it's called the mother and child reunion i've always wondered if the beatles were playing on that when they wrote that song oh sorry paul simon oh whoa bite my tongue thank goodness i have fact checkers anyway so this is the thing like we're all being unbuilt and what i want to do is get excited about it and allow, 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 let go, let go, let go, stop clinging, stop fighting, stop hanging on to what's past, stop trying to get back what can never be rebuilt, and instead start looking for swans. What in your life makes you go, oh, that's probably part of your next step, you guys. And if you can just believe it, we always want to hang our heads in shame and say, that cannot be for me. But even the hanging your head in shame is a trigger, is triggered by the longing that's triggered by the recognition of what you're meant to be. So let go of what we're losing. Look around you at what lights you up and and makes you afraid to even hope that you could be that. That's what you're becoming. That is what's being made of you. That is what I have to say about that. And now I would love to answer questions if anyone has them. Woo! Fabiola says, how do I reroot myself after feeling grief from my daughter going off to college and out of state, out of state, everything in our life is already transforming. Is it's if it's as if I've been dropped off in a strange place and I'm trying to find home. That is so eloquently put in the in the Psalms. The psalmist says, "I am a stranger in a strange land." Beautiful phrase. Um, and the reason it's beautiful is that that kind of loss is weirdly beautiful. Like we know that our children need to grow up. I, I really learned this when my son was diagnosed with Down syndrome. I, I thought about the day when my daughter would go, I had one daughter at the time, she'd go off to college. And then I thought, he'll never go off to college in all probability. And the only thing I could think of worse than a child growing up and going away was a child not growing up and going away, right? Like the culture didn't give me room to celebrate that. And so I realized, both constructions were cultural. I was being taught that it was a tragedy to have someone go away to college, and I was being taught that it was a tragedy to not have a kid go off to college. So you're caught either way if you stick with culture. But if you go in and look at the beauty of um, your relationship with your daughter and the incredible love with which you brought her into the world and raised her for 18 years, talk about amazing. It takes no time at all to kill someone. It takes so much to raise someone, right? To keep someone alive. And the beauty of that is manifested in the love you feel. The problem is that your attachment to the way the love was. And if you can, you just, you have to grieve it. As I say all the time, you have to go through the stages of grieving, denial, bargaining, um, grieving, anger, acceptance. 
So you let you lean into the feelings, you cry and cry, you feel alone, you let yourself fall apart as the mother of the child who was home. You lose that identity and then you're in don't know mind. You don't grab something else right away. It's not what you're becoming, it's what's being made of you. And what's being made of you and your daughter is a new dance of love. And you can't know what it looks like until you let her be a grown up. And I've, I've really learned a lot about that in the last five years or so, that I can't really love my children unless I let them just be who they are. And that means they're always changing. And I'm always changing. And the relationship we had yesterday is gone every single day, but it's always becoming, it's always becoming. Our focus on clinging to what we've built really causes us so much unnecessary grief. If we realize we never really built it in the first place, like you wouldn't know how to build a human in a lab, your body just did it by itself. But so that happens. And then growing up happens and separation happens. And all of it is unbuilding and building at the same time. So something really beautiful is going to come of your daughter growing up and going away. You're going to find a new relationship, a new dance of love that's going to make you think, oh my gosh, goodness, the initial one was nothing compared to how awesome this is. I get so much more joy from my children now than I ever did. And they were always delightful. Um, Gary says, how do we know for sure what our purpose is? I'm interested in many things, but struggle with shiny object syndrome. Um, I would suggest that you stop struggling because maybe shiny object syndrome is what you're meant to have. That is certainly true for me. I literally get distracted from business meetings and go chase squirrels if I'm in a room with windows to lock me up. I'm not kidding you. I have such bad ADD. But what that means is like, <laughs> I went to college and then you sign up for four classes. The college I went to, you sign up for four classes in a semester and they're really hard. And I was just talking with someone about taking classes that were enough alike that you could double count your, your um, papers. I did the opposite. My first year of college, I took Chinese, statistics, Shakespeare, and studio art. And my counselor looked at my schedule and said, are you nuts? Like, what are you trying to do with this? And I just, I said, I'm trying not to be bored because I have to change subjects every 20 minutes or I'm bored. Well, that tendency to change subjects every 20 minutes is what turned me into a writer and what helped made me able to help people. So what I suggest for you, Gary, is that you bounce after every shiny object that comes across your path as long as it interests you. And then a combination of those shiny objects is going to accumulate in your experience that no one else will have had. And it'll be like a beautiful piece of jewelry or something that's made of all these different parts. And nobody will have combined them the way you're going to combine them. So the genius of being able to see how they may connect with each other, that's the gift of something like ADD or shiny object syndrome or whatever you want to call it. But let it go. Stop struggling to be just one thing. Culture doesn't make categories for everything there is to be. It barely makes any categories at all, and most of them suck. Sorry if, you know, sorry if you don't like that language. Most of them, frankly, suck. All right, so go chase shiny objects and then find a way to get paid for it. Um, this is what a wayfinder does. <laughs> um, okay, Lisey says, is who I am inside me or around me or both? Exactly! Next question. No, it actually really truly is that. When I love what Nisargadatta Maharaj says. He says, when I look inside me and see that I am nothing, that is wisdom. Because what happens is you look inside and you go deep in and you realize it can get infinitely small. So it never ends. You just keep going in and in and then you start to feel vast. So you're like, whoa, there's, there is no thingness. I'm filled with no thingness. I am nothing. He says, when I look within me and see that I am nothing, that is wisdom. When I look around me and see that I am everything, that is love. And he said, that's what happens when you turn your gaze outward from that. And everything is a shiny object that is there just to please you. Everything is a swan that is there to show you what you are. Nisargadatta also said, don't you understand? God is doing all this for me. And of course, he meant for all of us. But yeah. 
You look inside to see that you are nothing and that is wisdom. You look around you and see that you are everything and that is love. Between these two, my life turns because there's no, there's actually no separation. And once you get rid of the body boundary, and all you have to do is lose the left hemisphere of your brain like Jill Bolte Taylor did when she had her stroke. And suddenly there was no separation boundary between self and world. And it's all nothing and it's all everything. And we don't really have words for that. But the austere version of quantum mechanics says that we're all just one wave function. There's no such thing as matter in the first place. So eventually our science got there. But what you're saying is what occurs to everybody who sits quietly for a long time. Is my identity inside me? Is it what's outside me? Yes, no, both. Between these two, my life turns. So just go into the outside world. This is what I've experienced lately is that I went off to the woods um, for like six years and it was a purely internal thing. Um, there weren't other people around me. Then I came out of the woods and I felt compelled to go back and become more human and start like doing the gathering room and stuff like go into humanity again because I got to the point where I really did not feel human at all. I know that may make some people feel nervous but I was just I was spirit. Uh, the fact that I still had a body was incidental. And then I came back and it's like humaning is hard but it's also incredibly joyful. So am I this? No. Yes. Is what's around me what I am? No. Yes. Everything is this interplay of stillness and becoming, which is also unbecoming all the time. If you don't think I'm making sense, read the Radiant Sutras. It'll make everything perfectly clear. Okay. Donna says, how can we help those around us stop clinging to who we were before? I can feel myself becoming someone new, but those around me want me to remain the busy, people-pleasing person I was. Hmm. Well, they can't make you. Learn from two-year-olds. If you try to pick up a two-year-old who's having a tantrum in, tantrum in a storm, in a storm, I meant in a store. I like to have tantrums in storms. No, but you know what they do. They get heavy. They get limp. And a 40 pound child or a 30 pound child, however big they are at that age, is literally unliftable when they're limp like that. You don't actually have to respond when people expect you to be who you were. You can actually say to them if you want, oh, you're expecting me to be who I was. I'm not. But if you argue with them, if you need them to come with you, if you need them to accept your unbecoming and accept the person you are becoming, you will wait forever and you will cling to their approval and you won't be able to flow into your own unfolding, your own unbuilding and what you are meant to become. You will never see the swans. So take your eyes off the ducks that want you in the duck nest. Go off by yourself, look up in the sky, look around you, look for things that light you up and make you, you know what you look, you're looking for you guys is the experience of awe. And when they ask people who are on their deathbeds, what was the best thing that ever happened to you? They go back and instead of talking about, even if talking about things that are typical, like the birth of children and so on, what they're about is not happiness, but all. It's almost as if we came here specifically for the many, many experiences, but the experience of all is the crown jewel. So stop looking at the people who are clinging to you and start looking for something that brings you into a state of awe. And if you're awed enough, then you actually won't have time. Like the, the swans will be there around you and the ducks will be going, nah, nah, come back and get pecked. And you'll be like, sorry, I gotta go with the swans. This is awesome, because it is. Okay, and one more question. Karen says, I just wanna chill and do nothing except be outside all the time. There are so many creative things I think I would like to do, but I keep reverting to doing very little. I do just enough to survive. Why does doing nothing make me happy? Why does creating seem too hard? It's because you're trying to create from within the constructs of our culture, which says you have to do it. So I'm back full circle to the place where I started, where if I accurately named this gathering room, it would be not what am I becoming, but what is being made of me. And sometimes when something is being made of you, I actually saw a, a thing online, someone uh, in the middle of summer, 
So this is what happens when you start baking and it says chill in the fridge for about an hour. And she'd taken everything out of her refrigerator and she was in there just chilling for about an hour. There are times in the creation of a thing when you allow things to go slack, when nothing is happening at all. And in those times, you guys, the longing to do nothing is like the, the ugly duckling looking at the swans. It is just like, oh my God, to truly do nothing, not to think, not to do anything, not even to breathe because breathing happens. When you let go of everything, that can be an exquisite surrender. It is exquisite. It's not because it's lack of all attachment and that means there's no suffering. You just slide into it. And then before you know it, something calls you back and something new is being made of you. And you guys, we have all been sent into the quiet and we are all being unbuilt and seriously, let's look to see, for, let's look for swans. Let's see what we're meant to become because I don't think it's anything we've seen before, but when we do see it, it will be truly awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I love having you here. I see you next week. Have a wonderful seven days and um, go be a swan. Bye.